Last speaker of today, Tom Rudelius from IAS Princeton, is going to talk about all 6D F theory SCFTs from group theory. Uh, great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come here and speak, uh, and, and for, to the organizers for organizing such a great conference. Uh, so, indeed, my talk today is on uh, all 6D F theory SCFTs from group theory. Uh, I'll be discussing some progress that we're making uh, towards sort of this novel classification of 60 SCFTs. Now, I should say a number of people have, have uh, noted that this is a very similar title to the talk that I gave at the F-Theory conference in Canada a couple of months ago. Uh, so let me say that although many of the ideas are similar, there's uh, certainly going to be a lot of new material here. So if you were at that conference and you're considering not paying attention to my talk, I would invite you to, to do so anyway. So uh, this talk is based on a number of papers, uh, primarily some work in progress with Jonathan Heckman and Alessandro Tomasiello, as well uh, as some work in progress with mathematician Darren Frey. So I'm going to begin today by reviewing the atomic classification of 60 superconformal field theories. I'm then going to discuss this new approach of realizing all of these 60 SCFTs from group theory. Uh, and finally, I'm going to summarize and present what I think are some exciting directions for future research. So to begin, the atomic classification of 60 SCFTs. The idea is that we're going to start with F-theory on some elliptically fibered, non-compact Calabi-Yau threefold. The picture that we get uh, looks like this. We have some base B2 with some curves intersecting according to some pattern. If we wrap D3 brains around these curves, we get a spectrum of strings in the six-dimensional theory. And as we've heard a couple of times, a hallmark of these six D theories are the presence of tensionless strings. So we take the, the size of these cur curves to zero. And then we can also have some singularities in the fiber. So over certain loci over some of these curves, the fiber can become singular, and this is going to give rise to gauge algebras and particles in the six-dimensional theory. For the strings, we can define something called the string charge, which is simply the negative self of the self-intersection number of a given curve. It turns out that this has to be an integer which is greater than zero and less than or equal to 12. So this leads to the famous result of uh, Morrison and Taylor in 2012. As I say, for curves of self-intersection minus 1 or minus 2, you can have a smooth fiber. But as soon as you have a curve of self-intersection minus 3 or below, you necessarily get some non-abelian gauge algebra. So uh, for, uh, you see, for, SU, for a minus 3 curve, you necessarily have an SU3, and it gets larger as you go on. There are also some non hexable clusters that involve more than one curve. So these guys here uh, have this minimal, these minimal gauge algebras, which cannot be higged by any massless matter. Now, I should say that these non hexable clusters are, are going to play a major role today. They're sort of the stars of today's show. Now, and as the stars of the show, these non hexable clusters uh, sort of have large egos, and they, they don't get along too well together. So what you need to do in a 60 SCFT that you're building out of these non hexable clusters is to si stick in some minus one curves in between them. And these act as, as sort of a buffer for the non hexable clusters. Now, in some cases, though, the, these non hexable clusters just have such large egos that even a minus one curve can't do the trick. And in particular, if you have some non hexable clusters with algebras G left, G right, which are not contained in E8, then these things cannot be attached by a minus one curve. So for instance, here in this 60 SCFT, you see we have an SU2 and an E7, which are glued together by this minus one curve. And over here, we have an F4 and an SU2. But both of those are OK, because SU2 times E7 is indeed a subalgebra of E8. But if we try to enhance this, say, to an SU3, then we'd violate this E8 gauging condition. Another important rule for classifying 60 SCFTs is that we need to be able to simultaneously contract all of the curves of the base to a point. 
And it's not too hard to see why this is. Taking a D3 brainer on one of these curves gives us a string whose tension is proportional to the volume of the string. If we're going to get a 60 SCFT, we need to eliminate all the mass scales from the theory, which means that all of the strings either need to have infinite tension or zero tension. So all the curves either have to go to infinite size, in which case we get a boring free theory, or else to zero size. And that's how we construct these interacting fixed points. Finally, the last rule for the atomic classification is that of anomaly cancellation. Something that's very nice about six dimensions is that anomalies impose very strong constraints. So given some string charge and given some uh, non-abelian gauge algebra, there's almost always a unique choice for the allowed charged matter. So for here, here, for instance, for a minus three curve carrying SO7 gauge algebra, you need exactly two massless spinners charged under this SO7. Anything else will violate anomaly cancellation. So these are, are basically the only three rules that go into the atomic classification of 6D, SCFTs. But uh, the results are, are quite elegant. So I'm going to mention two of the uh, main results from the classification of 6D SCFTs. The first one dates to before my time, which is a classification of endpoint bases. Given some base, you blow down all the minus one curves until you reach an endpoint. And these guys classified these endpoints. Uh, Fabio mentioned it briefly in the previous talk. They are labeled by orbifolds uh, C2 mod gamma, where gamma is some discrete subgroup of U2. And in particular, given some linear chain of these curves, you can find this continued fraction P over Q. And this P over Q tells you what is this orbifold singularity. So that's the first result. The other result I want to mention is the atomic classification result, which is that all six DSCFTs take the form of these generalized linear quivers. So note that these quivers are very simple. There are no loops. They're all tree-like. And there's some decoration allowed on the far left and on the far right, but in the interior, things are uniquely fixed. Note also that if we write down, uh, if we look at the, uh, the simply laced gauge groups G, G1, G2, G3, and so on, we find that these things obey a convexity condition. So they start small on the left, they get bigger, eventually they reach a plateau, and then they go back down on the right. So we have this picture, there's a ramp on the left, there's a plateau in the middle, there's a ramp on the right. So a couple of examples of this. Here's a case where we have all Gs equal to SU. So we have a bunch of SU gauge groups. You see that there's this ramp on the left, indicated with these boxes here. We have this plateau of SU4s in the middle, and we have a ramp down on the right. Note that the ramps don't have to be the same on the left and right. And note also that I'm introducing some new notation here. So an SU2 inside a square box indicates a flavor symmetry or a global symmetry, whereas these guys up here indicate gauge symmetries. A slightly more non-trivial example. Here we have a chain of E6 gauge groups. So here we have a plateau of E6s in the middle. On the left, we have this ramp. On the right, we have this other ramp. Uh, note also here that we see this repeated pattern of 1, 3, 1, 6, 1, 3, 1, 6, and so on and so forth. This 1, 3, 1 here is what's called E6, E6 conformal matter. So uh, a point of reference for Jonathan's talk earlier today. OK, so what we've seen then is that if, you, if we're thinking about these 60 SCFT quivers, they seem to have this uh, common structure where there's a ramp on the left, a plateau of a bunch of gauge groups in the middle, and then a ramp on the right. So characterizing these is, is, a basic, is basically just equivalent to characterizing the types of ramps that you can have on the left and the right. Because in the interior, you just have a bunch, you just have a plateau of these gauge groups repeating. So the idea then is to sort of rethink the atomic classification, uh, reframe it into a question of how do we characterize the ramps on the left and the right of these quivers. And it turns out that this can be done in terms of group theory. 
So to see this, we're first of all going to, need to, to, going to have to start with some, uh, some undeformed theories. And there are two types of theories that we want to consider, both of which can be realized in M3. The first one consists of taking some stack of NM5 brains to probe some orbifold singularity of A, D, or E type. And the resulting quiver looks like this. Here you see we have a plateau of a bunch of gauge groups G. On the left and right there are these flavor symmetries G. And note that this G here is the ADE type that matches this orbifold singularity. As a just slightly more complicated example, we can now shift this stack of M5 brains probing the orbifold singularity so that it also probes an E8 wall. So here we have an E8 wall that the stack is probing on the left. As a result, we get this E8 global symmetry over here, but the rest of the quiver looks exactly the same. So now here's the point, here's the claim, is that all known 60 SCFTs with a sufficiently long plateau of gauge groups in the middle realized is a deformation of one of those two families of theories. And each such deformation is labeled simply by a pair of homomorphisms, mu left and mu right. Where here, mu left characterizes the ramp on the left, and mu right characterizes the ramp on the right. So uh, what are these classes of homomorphisms that mu left and mu right are supposed to be a part of? Well, in the first case, where we just have him five brains on a normal fold singularity, both mu left and mu right are, are homomorphisms from SU2 into some Lie algebras, G left and G right, such that uh, their gauge groups, or the, the groups G left and G right, are subgroups of G, which is the ADE type here. Note that another name for homomorphisms from SU2 into some Lie algebra G is a nilpotent orbit of G. So we're, say, we're learning that these ramps these deformations are labeled by nilpotent orbits. If, on the other hand, we take it to probe an E8 wall on the left, well, what happens on the right is just the same. We have some nilpotent orbit. But on the left now, it's a different class of homomorphisms, which goes from gamma ADE into E8. Now, where do, where do these classes of homomorphisms come from? The first one is predicted by F theory. The second one is predicted by heterotic M theory. And I'm not going to discuss this further for lack of time, but instead I'll, I'll point you to uh, this paper from Del Zotto, Heckman, Tomasiello, and Vafa in 2014, or uh, you can look up the video of my talk in Banff. But the point is that both of these correspondences were actually conjectured back in 2014 via string theory before they were actually observed in the atomic classification. So to see how this works is perhaps best just to, to look at a couple of examples. So here's the example of G equals SU4. So we have a M5 brains on a Z4 singularity. So we get a plateau of SO, SU4 gauge groups here. But now if we want to characterize the ramps on the left side of this quiver, we learn that, from what I just said, that these should be labeled by homomorphisms from SU2 into SU4, which are well known to be labeled simply by partitions of four. There are five such partitions, which you can see here, and correspondingly, there are these five different ramps, these five different superconformal field theories. You can do the D-type and E-type cases as well. So here's the E6 case. We have a chain, so a plateau of E6s. We have some ramp characterized by a, by a nilpotent orbit of E6. Now, rather than having a partition which labels these nilpotent orbits, we instead have what's called a Balakarter label. But you can see that for each choice of Balakarter label, there's an associated 60 SCFT. For each such homomorphism, we get a ramp on the left. You can do non-simply laced guys as well. So for G2, we have G2, a subalgebra of E8. And we can realize these homomorphisms from SU2 into G2 by these particular uh, theories here. So here we have a plateau of E8 gauge groups, but on the left we have this breaking down uh, to G2 and subalgebras of that. 
For the other case of homomorphisms from discrete subgroups of SU2 into E8, we have an example here of uh, SU3. So this is homomorphisms from Z3 into E8. There are five such homomorphisms labeled by these Dinkin diagrams. And you note that Dinkin diagrams are precisely the flavor symmetries of these associated 60 SCFTs. So here's the point, and I think this is uh, sort of one of the two most exciting slides in my talk, is that we can therefore characterize long 60 SCFTs, in other words, 60 SCFTs with this plateau of gauge groups G, by four simple pieces of data. The choice of ADE group G in the plateau, the length N of the plateau, and then the homomorphisms, mu left and mu right. So this enormous atomic classification uh, this, you know, in this even vaster sea of possible geometries or quivers that you might have thought would work out, in the end can be boiled down to just these four pieces of data. But now you might ask, what about short 60 SCFTs? So far I've, I've concentrated on the case where we have long SCFTs with these nice plateaus, and that's important because it ensures that the deformations on the left, characterized by one homomorphism, don't talk to the to the homomorphisms on the right. So whatever's happening on the left of the quiver is divorced by this plateau from what's happening on the right. But as we'll see, in the case of short 60 SCFTs, this is no longer the case. What's happening on the left starts to talk to what's happening on the right, and things become much more subtle. So as an example, we can revisit this theory that we saw earlier. Here we have this uh, plateau of SU4s. We had this ramp here on the left, characterized by this partition. We had a ramp on the right, characterized by this partition. Now we want to take the length of this plateau n to go to zero. What we see happens is that the deformation on the left and the deformation on the right collide. We no longer have a plateau of SU4s at all. And in fact, we see now that we actually have a plateau of SU3s. So if we wanted to, we could characterize this theory with uh, these, with G equals SU4 and these homomorphisms as this theory down here with G equals SU3 and these homomorphisms. So what's happened is that we've taken one theory related by some uh, four pieces of data, G, N, mu left, and mu right, and we've shown that it's actually equal to, a diff to, to another theory labeled by different pieces of data. So clearly, in the case of these short 60 SCFTs, this group theoretic description is no longer unique. And in fact, we expect that there are going to be some, in, ca in some cases, many choices of mu left and mu right, which don't give rise to a consistent theory. So clearly, the short case is more subtle. Nonetheless, I claim that almost all short 60 SCFTs can still be labeled in this group theoretic sense by a choice of gauge group G, a homomorphisms, and the length N of some plateau, which is now possibly equal to zero, or in some cases, even negative. So this involves some sort of analytic continuation from the theories that we've seen. Note that not, pair, not all pairs of homomorphisms are going to be allowed here, and as we just saw, the description is no longer going to be unique. But nonetheless, it seems that in almost all cases, you can still find such a choice which will give rise to a given 60 SCFT. So as an example, I would say this is the other of the two most exciting slides in my talk. We can actually realize all of these famous non higgsable clusters in terms of these four pieces of group data. So just as before, we have some plateau group, G. We have some number of which it appears, which you can see in this case is always either 0 or 1. And then we have a pair of homomorphisms labeling what's happening on the left and the right. In this case, you see that always on the right, we're looking at some trivial class of homomorphisms. But on the left, the choice varies. And so here where we have, say, gamma E6 to E8, you should think of this theory as corresponding to one particular homomorphism in this class. So to be even more explicit, for the case of this non hexable cluster, G2 times SU2 gauge algebra, we can actually realize this is the limit of this larger classes of theories, this larger class of theories here. So we have here a chain of a plateau 
of E6 gauge algebras, uh, indexed by the number of them n. We have some trivial homomorphism on the right, and on the left we have a homomorphism from SU2 into E6, which is labeled by this particular Bala Carter label. So the point is, if we take the limit as n goes to zero, this theory actually becomes this one. In other words, this theory, which seems like sort of an outlier, is part of a larger family of theories in this group theoretic classification. Now you might wonder, you know, what, what's the sense in which this is true? How do you check something like this? Well, for 60 SCFTs, it being strongly non-Lagrangian theories, there isn't too much we can compute. But something we do know how to compute, thanks to the work of Tashikawa et al., are the anomalies, the Tuft anomalies, for all of these atomic 60 SCFTs. And so in particular, we can compute the anomaly polynomial for this here on the left, and we can compute the anomaly polynomials for these theories here as a function of n, and then we can just perform an analytic continuation of the anomaly polynomial to n equals zero here, in some cases even to n less than zero, to n equals negative one, and in this case we find that there's this match. So this is a highly non-trivial check that indeed this theory is arising as part of this group theoretic classification, it's part of this larger family of 60 SCFTs. So at this point you, want, you might wonder, do all 60 SCFTs admit a group theoretic description in this manner? Unfortunately, the answer seems to be no at this point. So here's an example. We have an E8 gauge algebra here, and we have what's called a rank 10 E string. So this chain of 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, curves. So there's no clear way that one could realize this as some E8 group with some mu left and mu right. The chain over here is, is just too long to be realized as any single homomorphism. However, there is a sense in which this is related to a pair of homo homomorphisms after all. So in particular, I can start with this theory here. So this is a theory that's in the group theoretic classification. There's a, an E8 plateau with n equals 1. And then there's a mu left over here, labeled by this Bella Carter label, and a mu right labeled by the same Bella Carter label. What we can do now in F theory is blow down these minus 1 curves and blow down all these, these chains until we get a minus 2 curve E8 gauge algebra and a pair of special points, which indicate locations of this blowdown. Now what we can do is we can take these two singular points to collide. We get a theory that, uh, geometry that looks like this, and now we can blow this thing back up, and we get the theory we were looking for from the previous slide. So in some sense, this theory, although it's an outlier, can nonetheless be realized as sort of a limit of this theory where we take these singularities to collide. Now, for those of you who are wondering, how is this an F theory talk? Now it's an F theory talk. There's a Weierstrass model which describes this. And you see that if you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, uh, these two things collide. You get this enhancement. And uh, that corresponds to going from here to here. And you can blow up and get the two things that we saw at the top and bottom of the previous slide. OK, so let me uh, summarize here and present some directions for future research. I reviewed atomic classification of 60 SCFTs, uh, which has constructed all the SCFTs that we know about, uh, at least so far, barring some future work on frozen singularities from Alessandro et al. Uh, we've now seen this novel approach to the classification of 60 SCFTs, in which all long 60 SCFTs and almost all short 60 SCFTs can be realized in terms of these four simple pieces of group data. There seem to be some outliers, but in the final analysis, these things might go away. There might be a sense in re which we can realize them as colliding homomorphisms. OK, with my last couple minutes, uh, I want to review or sort of talk about what I think are some of the most exciting directions for future research. I think what, uh, what I've presented already today is sort of a, a very elegant result. But what's especially exciting about it to me are the possibilities that it suggests for future avenues of study of superconformal field theories in six dimensions. The first thing 
is that something that we've already understood is that renormalization group flows between 60 SCFTs have a very close connection with these uh, homomorphic deformations. And we can actually use the ordering on nilpotent orbits to come up with an ordering on renormalization group flows. So this gives us hope that we might actually be able to classify renormalization group flows in 60 SCFTs completely, at least in the case of these long theories. The second direction would be compactification. We know how to compactify these base uh, theories, these parent theories, if you will, on S1 and T2. So the idea is, if all 60 SCFTs can be realized as deformations of this theory, perhaps there's some simple way to realize their compactifications as deformations of this theory. There's a very close relationship between these theories that we're seeing and theories of class S. In fact, you can realize the same quiver in a class S theory using the same sorts of group data which labeled the partitions of this Riemann surface. From a pure, purely mathematical perspective, we can actually use this to, to conjecturally classify homomorphisms from discrete subgroups of SU2 into E8 for the first time. This is some work that's uh, in progress with my collaborator, Darren Frey. And finally, an open question that I'll leave you with is, is there a deeper reason for all this? Is there a deeper reason why this works? Is it just an accident of the lamppost of 60 SCFTs that we've seen so far? Or is there some deeper property of the landscape of 60 SCFTs which accounts for this relationship to group theory? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Questions? Yeah, Tom. So, so you have this very nice classification through group theory of, in particular, the non higgsable clusters. So I have two questions about that. One is, if you just started with that classification and didn't know the list of non higgsable clusters, including the multi-object ones, would you be able to make that list and show that there's nothing else? And the second question is, it looked like on your data you had the same thing for the 3-2 and the 3-2-2. Are those distinguished in the group theory description? Those are the two questions. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, there we go. OK, yeah, thanks. Uh, good. So the, the answer to your first question is no. Uh, in fact, from the group theory description, I don't see anything that singles out these non higgsable clusters as being special in any way. I can, you know, there, there are lots and lots of examples where you can write them in terms of these four pieces of data, and the non higgsable clusters just seem sort of as, uh, just like anything else, is much, much more democratic in that sense. Um, yes, there is a difference. This is one particular homomorphism from here to here, which is labeled by this Ballacarter label. And then this one is labeled by a different Ballacarter label. So I w I'm showing here the classes, and then there are some particular elements of these classes. More questions? If not, let's thank Tom again and all the speakers of today. And see you tomorrow.